because it is now time for our women's observance. And our theme this year is uh, women growing, empowering, honoring our own. As educators, we all play a crucial role in encouraging girls and women um, to not let those Stone Age stereotypes stop them from being athletes and scientists and engineers and leaders, whatever they aspire to be. And as advocates, we continue to emphasize that our society seriously and continually underutilizes the leadership skills, the brain power, the heart and soul of half our population. The numbers don't lie. Only 6% of CEOs of America's largest 500 corporations are women. 94% are men. Only 16% of all corporate executives are women. In the public sector, the numbers are only a little bit better. 18% of mayors are women. 24% of state government executive officers are women. And 30% of senior executive positions in the federal government are held by women. Not nearly half. As for our lawmakers, only 19% of the members of Congress, 19% are women. 24% of your state legislators are women. There is no denying that we still have a gender gap in our nation. And even worse, when you look at women of color in leadership positions, you see a gender gap and a race gap. In education, more than 70% of the workforce is female. The leadership numbers show a different story. 26% of university and college presidents are women. Only 30 percent of high school principals are women. 42 percent middle school principals are women. 64 percent of elementary school principals are women. But I'm very happy to report that things are quite different in the National Education Association. 100 percent of our executive officers are women. 60%, 60% of our state affiliate presidents are women. That was not always the case. And 56% of you, our board members sitting here in this room, are women. 63% of NEA staff executive directors and managers are women. Historically, NEA's always been a little bit ahead of the rest of the nation when it comes to women in leadership, men and women of color in leadership. And one reason is that we actively pursue diversity. We are deliberately diverse. And we've done a good job recruiting and then nurturing young leaders. Uh, Becky and Princess and I all benefited from this association, local, state, and national leadership training programs when we were coming up. And we have to continue this fine tradition of growing and nurturing and honoring our own if we're going to stay a strong and vital representative organization. And that's why I'm so excited about the speaker who was chosen to join us today. Here to introduce our very, very special speaker is the chair of the NEA Women's Issues Committee, Cecile Ben-David. And this is Cecile's first women's observance as the WIC chair. Please give her a nice round of applause. Thank you, Lily. And this is my first time speaking at the mic. So I hope you'll all be kind. <laughs> uh, Lily, what, a, uh, what an honor it is for me to stand here as chair of the Women's Issues Committee. 
As Lily indicated, NEA practices what it preaches when it comes to providing full and equal support for women. I am so proud of my association. Lily Esperson Garcia, Rebecca S. Pringle, and Princess Moss, but we know them as Lily, Becky, and Princess, and we all love them. These are the leaders who make us proud. These are three leaders whose fierce commitment to public school and college educators and their students will, will see us through challenging times. Lily, Becky, and Princess, three strong women. NEA truly can serve as a beacon for the rest of America. Now, in the spirit of growing and empowering and honoring our own, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Chelsea Jo Herrick. Chelsea Jo is a young yet strong woman. She is, she is an example of the future leaders of the NEA and maybe your future president. Yay. Hey, Chelsea Jo will tell us about the path she took to leadership, and you can read about her in the board website. So let me just give you a few pointers. Chelsea Jo grew up in a small town in southwest Minnesota. Her mother worked two jobs and struggled to make ends meet in a single parent household. But neither Chelsea Jo nor her mother ever wavered in their determination that Chelsea Jo would get a college education. Chelsea Jo won scholarships, took out student loans, and worked 20 to 30 hours a week while still carrying a full-time class load. She still found time to be a student leader on her campus, and she graduated from Southwest Minnesota State University with a degree in Elementary education. <laughs> to earn money, Chelsea Jo worked as a nanny for two boys. She provided home care assistance for a man with disabilities. She coached gymnastics and baseball. She led a Teens Against Tobacco advertising campaign in her community, and she lobbied in the state legislature. Chelsea Jo Herrick has never shied away from a challenge. She is the first female to be elected chair of the NEA student program in eight years. My colleagues, please give this dynamic young woman of ours a big NEA welcome, Chelsea Jo Herrick. not my first time at this microphone, however, it is in this setting. Thank you, Cecile, and the Women's Issues Committee for providing this opportunity. Wow. I've had the honor of sitting where all of you are as the student board of director, and at the last board meeting, I was shaking at the knees when I had to read the preamble. But standing here today is a combination of emotions that I've never experienced. It's exciting, inspiring, and scary. <laughs> standing up here feeling this large dose of emotions is one thing, but standing up here next to the three most influential, powerful leaders, knowing that the Women's Issues Committee could have picked anyone in the world, I need to take a, take a minute and get a grip. <laughs> At first, when Cecile asked me to accept this wonderful opportunity, I was ecstatic. After it sunk in what I had accepted, I was terrified. <laughs> I don't have a heroic story. When have I ever been held back or looked down upon because I was female? I couldn't think of a significant time in my life that I'd beat the odds. I'm only 22 years old. I don't have that immediate memory of fighting for women's right to vote or for women educators fighting for equal pay as their male counterparts. Heck. <laughs> The only female in my history books was Rosa Parks. Frantically, I was searching for my story, my path to leadership. Immediately, I looked to my childhood. 
All my STEM teachers were female, so I didn't beat any odds there. My role model and utmost influential person in my life was my middle school principal. Again, she was female. I was stuck. I had no idea what I was going to talk about. And then it dawned on me that my story isn't about a struggle or beating the odds. My story is the fact that women in leadership is imperative to more women finding their path to leadership. But I couldn't have done it without the constant reminder that I had it in me to succeed. You see, in a small town, growing up in a single parent home had stereotypes of its own. One email still sticks in my mind. I can't be your friend because my mom says you'll be the first to drink, smoke, and try drugs. I also don't like being your friend because I don't like being made fun of. I kept that email to remind myself that I had to do better. You know when you're going through a hard time and you wish that you could just look into the future and see that everything was going to be just fine and that you were going to overcome that challenge? I'm well into the future. And even though I never have, still to this day, have never smoked a cigarette and I my classmates drank their way through college and high school while poking fun at me that I was a goody two-shoe. That email still hurts, but I'm a firm believer that everything happens for a reason. From that moment on, I was determined that I was going to define the perception of who I am and who I'd become, rather than letting others tell me what my future held. I was in sixth grade. Middle school is naturally hard for anyone at that age. I had accepted that I would never fit in or be liked by my peers long before middle school. Many of you and most people don't know why I go by Chelsea Joe or Chelsea Joe Herrig. In elementary school, I was bullied because my last name was associated with the cops. The cops because they always had a reason to look for my absent father. It was associated with drugs. Drugs because I can remember what he, my absent father, looked like after he was beaten by eight metal baseball bats for a drug deal gone wrong the night that I was supposed to visit him. Most of you don't know that my last name is hyphenated, unless you look at the board packet ahead of time, and it's Chelsea with an A, or with a Y, not an A. My full name is Chelsea Joe Herrick Payne. I tried to stop the bullying by only claiming half of my last name, but my fifth grade, when I requested it to my fifth grade teacher, she told me that it wasn't my legal name, and so if I wanted to be called that, I had to change it legally. My fifth grade teacher was the last person that I let bully me. When I couldn't see the board to take notes, she slammed her hand down on my desk and asked why I didn't have glasses. Is it because your mom decided to purchase cigarettes instead? Yet another single mother stereotype. For more than one reason, I was glad to move on from fifth grade and enter middle school. Little did I know how much I was going to appreciate and grow in middle school. My middle school principal was more than just a pal to me. She saw potential in me. After receiving that email, she's the one who gave me the confidence that I could become more than a stereotype. My middle school principal taught me more than the difference between I seen that movie and I saw that movie. <laughs> she taught me that people's opinion of me didn't matter. Mrs. Wilkinson taught me that no dream is too big. The best part about her advice is that it's the reason that I ran for this position and the reason why I'm standing before you today. When I told her that I didn't think I had a chance, but that I needed to throw my name in the hat for the future of education, she told me, Chelsea, whenever you put your heart on a goal, you give it 110%, and for that you will never lose. While what I've described initially seems like the glass ceiling of a child from a single parent home living paycheck to paycheck to you, to me, it's the positive influence of women in my everyday life, women that I admired with strength and courage. I wouldn't change my childhood for anything. Who says you have to be president of the United States or an elected leader for that matter to be recognized as a leader? Everyone is someone's child. My mother raised me as a single parent, thankfully with my grandma just down the street. Between the two of them, my mother taught me that I was going to have to work hard for every penny, and my grandma taught me that anything is possible with strength and determination. I watched my mom struggle to make each paycheck last until the next. So on April 9th, 2005, my 14th birthday, I started my first job. 
I was eager to help my mom in any way that I could. As you heard from Cecile, I was very active in extracurricular activities, which wasn't cheap. My dance shoes and my sports, piece, sports fees were not vital for survival, but my mother never said no, and my grandma always offered assistance because they knew that it would build my character. When the extracurricular activities became just another place for my peers to bully me or elders to judge me based on where I came from, they reinforced my desire to prove them wrong. I can't express to you how badly I wanted to prove them all wrong. My, parent, my mom and my grandma also taught me to be humble and empathetic. I may not have had the coolest school supplies or braces for the pearly white straight smile or the most expensive prom dress, but I had learned values and lessons about life that some of my peers may never encompass. There are people who live and survive on less. I'm sure many of you are picturing that student that resembles my story because my story isn't a rare story. And I can stand up here all day and tell you story after story about my childhood, but I wouldn't be doing what my peers elected me to do, nor would I be satisfied if I didn't share with you why I ran for this position. I believe that every student studying to be an educator should be a member of the NEA student program. I also strongly believe that every student member should seek active membership following graduation. But more than that, they need to be an active, engaged member of this association. I may not have years of teaching under my belt, but let me tell you what I do have on my mind as I go to sleep every night and wake up every morning. I have students that I think about too, but my fear for the future of education consumes my thoughts. Fear for the learning environment of students and fear for the working conditions of the next generation of educators and their veteran colleagues. Issues like college affordability, the endless testing environment, social justice issues, the rapidly changing and inclusion of technology, and most importantly, the, the importance of caring for the whole child. These are all issues that new and young educators share. So when my mind starts to wander while I'm driving home at night, or when I'm flying around the United States to motivate and inspire, recruit and retain my peers, I'm seeking answers to the following questions. How can we keep aspiring young educators from pursuing their second career choice because of student debt or the teaching to the test environment? How can we help our new and young educators find and utilize their voice? Where is our place in this association? How can we help them understand that this is where they belong? That this is how they will create change and improve student learning conditions? As aspiring educators, we hear the stories about never having enough time or resources, and we, hear, we read the articles about veteran teachers who leave the profession they absolutely love because it's just no longer what it used to be or what it should be. We wonder why there's a decline of enrollment in the teacher prep programs, but everyone in this room is very aware of the culture of education today. We're surrounded by the negative perceptions of education. Who would want to be associated with the rotten apple on the front of a Time magazine? Who would knowingly put thousands of dollars towards an education where their degree is just a piece of paper and their work is devalued and misunderstood? Knowing that we have, ex we have learned mastered skills to expose students' creativity and innovative thinking skills, differentiate instruction for all learning styles, and to help and to, to, devel do, to develop engaging and rich lesson plans, but only to help students become good test takers? Who would do that? Do you want to know who? The 60,000 members of your NEA student program. Some of them are right in your backyard and they're eager to get involved. We entered the profession knowing that it was going to, going to be a challenge, but we did it because we know that the world needs great educators. We see those giant rewards that non-education folk are blind to. We see possibilities. We know students need us to motivate and inspire them. We know that students need us to be their advocates. We are ready to stand up for our profession. The day that we decide to become an educator is the day that we decide to stand up for all students in America. So the most prominent question that consumes the majority of my thoughts, and I hope that you too begin to ponder it, how do we establish a foundation where the NEA student program the future of NEA and the future of education is heard and respected at all levels and all angles of this association. 
Because NEA, educators across America, and most importantly, our students, need a strong and educated next generation of advocates. And the Chinese proverb says it best, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, the, best time, the next best time is now. Now is the time that we need to grow a forest of fearless leaders who will never give up. I fear that because we are the first generation of testing robots, that we will never see a world other than teaching to the test. I fear that our young educators and student members, if they don't find a place in this association, that more students are going to come to school hungry with more teachers who are burnt out and the, 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 the culture of education policy will continue to destroy our schools. But like all my female role models have taught me, we will never give up. That is why I ran for this position. Because I couldn't be more proud to represent such a determined young group of leaders who will never give up. If women had given up 75 years ago, women wouldn't have the right to vote, and we wouldn't be on the path to electing the first woman president. <laughs> Females make up half of our population, and we work in a field predominantly occupied by women. The fact that we have three women in power of the largest labor union in America representing the most influential and important profession in the world should be a powerful statement in and of itself. <laughs> but not only did they rise to the challenge of being female, they rose to power as women of color. Someday I'll have the imprinted memory of what I was doing when the world transformed its views on women's rights. I'll be able to say that I was elected chair of the NEA student program, the largest influential student group, the same RA as these women who have made history. As future educators, we're always told that we have to model the behavior we want our students to inhabit because they see us as role models. There are success stories all around because of what you and your colleagues are doing back in your states. So not only have we set an example for our students by electing Lily, Becky, and Princess, but we've modeled it for the world. We've shown light where it has never been shown before. The grown, the stubborn, and the generations to come will look back on this amazing path laid out before us and say, that is when women truly transformed, the world truly transformed their views on women's rights. We have the opportunity of a lifetime to demonstrate to NEA members, potential members, and their communities that when women are in power, we will succeed. And I got a five minute warning, so I'm gonna skip ahead. Um, <laughs> Since today is the theme of growing your own, I, want, I don't think that my speech would be complete if I didn't mention a few of those who have influenced me along my path to leadership within the association. And the first person that I want to highlight is Denise Speck, Education Minnesota President. I'm confident that if you looked up the Webster's Dictionary version of a leader, her picture would be right beside it. Becky, you were the influential speech that inspired me to get more involved. And last but not least, all of you board of directors for the encouragement and support. Some of you even showed up at the election at the Student Leadership Conference supporting my campaign shirt. And I will never be able to thank you enough for express how much that meant to me and still means to me. So while my mind has always been driven towards leadership because of women in my past, my rise to leadership of this particular position can be credited to the leaders within this association. We truly are an association that grows its own. Before we continue our work back in our states and today, we must thank Susan B. Anthony, Alice Paul, and Lucy Burns, and more recently, Alice Walker, Betty Frieden, and Gloria Steinem for blazing the way for women's rights. They are true champions for all women today, and without them, I wouldn't be able to thank the Women's Issues Committee and NEA for this wonderful opportunity. Lily for being that fearless leader that we all need to continue battling in our work and for being the example that the world needs to see in order to create change for the whole child and all of our schools. Becky for your courage and your passion which creates and influences more leaders. You are just what our new and young educators need to get fired up and involved with this association. Princess for your humble encouragement and your optimism as we push forward in all efforts of the association your attitude and positive attitude keeps us motivated. I can only hope to become as amazing as you three. And I'd also thank my middle school principal, my mom, my grandma, 
And I can even thank my fifth grade teacher and my, the mother of a sixth grade parent for giving me a reason to be persistent and stubborn. I am definitely one lucky woman to have women pave the way before me so that I could find this path to leadership. Thank you. great, wasn't it? That's the, that's the first item of business from my new Women's Issues Committee, and I think we did a great job. <laughs> Thank you. Members of my committee, well, we're going to make you late for lunch, but I hope you enjoy the next part of our presentation. And so we have a special recognition for our three women leaders. So if you would please stand. to do something special from the um, Women's Issues Committee. So we called Barack Obama <laughs> and we asked him to issue a proclamation <laughs> from the White House. And you know what? He did. <laughs> We're going to have them framed for you. Yeah? They asked me to uh, read his words, so if you will bear with me. Uh, I send greetings to all those attending the National Education Association's February Board Observance Honoring Women. And I am pleased to join in recognizing President Lily Eskelson Garcia, Vice President Becky Pringle, and Secretary Treasurer Princess Moss. Our educators and administrators work tirelessly to provide a world-class education to America's sons and daughters, equipping students with the tools they need to meet the challenges of today and tomorrow. They give young people of all backgrounds the chance to go as far as their dreams will take them. Breaking down barriers for women of color, Lily Eskelson Garcia, Becky Pringle, and Princess Moss have played an important role in supporting teachers and school leaders and cultivating our children's talents. With leadership that reflects the diversity of its membership, NEA is helping lay a strong foundation for all our nation's children to thrive. I am grateful to all those dedicated to educating and empowering students across our country, and I wish you the best, Barack Obama. Don't sit down yet. All right, so in addition to the White House proclamation, uh, and to show our love and uh, respect as we near Valentine's Day, we want to present each of you a dozen roses. From the Women's Issues Committee, Let's hear it for Chelsea Joe. 